Welcome, dirty peasants, to Warwood Gazette, the Amphibia podcast. This week it is episode 34, and we're covering Amphibia Season 1, episode 14, Snow Day and Cracking Mrs. Croker. I'm your host, Lombaticon, and joining me today we have Pixels. What's up, everybody? And Nick. Hey, guys. So we just got off uh, Season 3A, and that was, I mean, it was new episodes. <laughs> yeah. Strong start. Really strong start. Season yeah. Three. And, uh, now we're, I already uh, miss it. <laughs> yeah. We gotta wait like a couple months. It'll go by. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. You always say that. Well, what else can I say? <laughs> <laughs> we'll just have to watch. We'll just have a bunch of different shows to carry us. Then we'll just <laughs> we'll just have to focus on what's coming. Then I can catch up on inside job. Yeah. <laughs> we got yeah, Owl like... House season two B coming. We got I don't know Hills or something. Big City Greens. Yeah, Big oh, City yeah. Greens. Yeah. And this is just there's, yeah. There's still things out there to keep us. Sated until uh, Phoebe comes back. Mm-hmm. The main course. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's not a dig at the other shows. Just like, no, yeah, of course not. Yeah. <laughs> We're not. We love them. Don't worry. <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's no news this week. So, I think we'll go. Well, the, the order, like the first segment of this episode was Snow Day, and the second one was Cracking Mrs. Croker. Uh, we're gonna cover Cracking Mrs. Croker first because we wanna end on a high note. We're just like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, it's not, I'm not saying like, we, yeah, wait, we, we, it. we we love we love. There's no there's yeah there's, there's we love no Cracking Mrs. Croker. It just right. It's just yeah. Snow Day is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. winter at Christmas episodes are always exactly. popular. Yeah. Exactly. If and even if Snow Day was a bad episode, we would have we would have covered it again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Snow Day was always oh, uh, cracking Mrs. Croker. Crack, crack, Mrs. Croker. <laughs> You're so, in pain, so, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> cracking Mrs. Croker was written by Geneva Mai, storyboards by Aaron Austin and Hannah Yobi, and directed by Bert Yoon. So, <laughs> I exited the video where I had everything <laughs> in my bad. Yeah, Alright, so the segment starts off with Anne, Sprig, and Polly walking through the park. Not park. The town. And uh, the town seems to really like Sprig. Like they all, like he knows all their names. Uh, they're like, yeah, he's just like super friendly with everyone. Everyone's super friendly with him, with the exception of uh, Mrs. Croker, who just ignores him when when he greets her, but manages to still like greet Anne and Polly before heading into the into the store. Sprig is worried that Mrs. Croker doesn't like him, but Anne and Polly just tell him not to worry about it, but he uh, does the exact opposite. Attempts to help her out with her groceries, she just ignores him and just drives away. Sprig's devastated, Anne tries to like give her own experience with some other kid at her school, Jeremy Krieger. Does, it doesn't matter, but... Uh, <laughs> But Sprig is still uh, adamant to getting Miss Crow to like her, like him, and we get a quick like montage of the other townsfolk talking about how like Croker is just the same old same old person who's just everyone just describes her as like old and cranky, 
Except Maddie, who just like is obsessed with her smell. <laughs> so Sprig's devastated, Hop Hop comes out. They all don't care about they don't care about Mrs. Croker not liking Sprig. But later Sprig comes up with a brilliant plan uh to change this where he explains to Anne that he plans on to he plans on breaking into her home and searching through her belongings to find the one thing that she needs in life or whatever to stay with me vandalism <laughs> yeah so he he wants to he, he he thinks this is the solution and Anne rightfully calls him out on this but he's not uh he's not interested he's not listening yeah. Yeah, he's just not listening, doesn't care. So, like, we we get we cut to Mrs. Croker's house while she's le- going out. He breaks in. Then eventually, Anne and Paul he actually followed him, try to convince him to leave. They get in a struggle with some box that eventually, uh, that eventually, like, like all the stuff Sprig was holding eventually sp- spills out, and then. A chest opens with a bunch of like photos and maps, all focused on this one guy named Jonah. So Sprig comes to the conclusion that Jonah must be Mrs. Croker's like long lost love and plans to uh reunite them and he just maybe assumes I love it. <laughs> and and maybe then Mrs. Croker would finally like him for reuniting these lovebirds. So he runs off uh, while Anne and Polly uh, stay to just look at more photos of Hawk Croker. (laughs) (laughs) So Spring eventually goes to this guy's house. He's as old as Mrs. Croker. Tells him about Mrs. Croker. He's on board because he's been waiting years to reunite with her again. Uh... He eventually leads him back to Mrs. Croker's house, and then when when she opens the door, uh, like they're both in shock. Sprig thinks they're about to flirt, but then Jonah pulls out his crossbow and uh, tries to kill Mrs. Croker, and talks about how like he's been searching like years, like I think I believe it was 30, 30, 30, yeah, 30, 30 years in the same town, and he finally found her. And he still yet yeah, didn't look for her. <laughs> After 30 years, there's like a population of like 20 frogs in the whole town. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, it's not as a founder. <laughs> so, yeah, they. <laughs> so, <laughs> while they're arguing about who's older, uh, like, Sprig tries jumping in to, uh, to save her, but then she immediately, like, brushes him off and just handles the situation herself. Uh,. Like we find this is the episode where we find out that like Mrs. Croker can like actually like fight, takes him out. Uh, her pet spider Archie delivers like that final like blow, and then <laughs> so yeah. At this point, like Mrs. Croker, Mrs. Croker is less like annoyed. She's less like mad and more just annoyed and confused about how all this happened. Uh, so then Sprig basically explains that like he just wanted. Scroger notice like me, him. senpai. Pardon? I said, notice me, senpai. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And then, like, she just laughs at him, and just, the reason, she explains that the reason she doesn't like Sprague is just that he just, she just doesn't like him. But, uh, <laughs> because he went through all this, like, trouble just to get her to like him back, she decides to give him a chance and the episode ends with the uh, sprig gloating <laughs> and that's that's cracking mrs croker <laughs> it's like a bad power rangers episode holy crap <laughs> <laughs> it really is like that <laughs> okay so i'm not gonna okay i'm like I, I stand by the fact that this is still a very funny episode. <laughs> okay, yeah, I won't deny. Like the reason mm-hmm. I wouldn't call this a bad episode is because just it's just like hilarious, especially like the the last the last like 
three minutes, I think, like, saved this segment from, like, being something I just wouldn't want to rewatch. But, like, yeah, Grover could kick ass, so yeah, you can't deny how good that fight for. is. Oh, yeah, and the dialogue, yeah, and uh, like. Actually, I'll I'll save a little bit more of my thoughts later. Like, uh, Pic- Pixels, what what were your thoughts on? This <laughs> of course, um, it's a fine episode. I watched it over, and I was like, I my my uh, my opinion has changed about the episode. It's a, it's a pretty funny episode. The but holy crap, Sprig! Yeah, Sprig was just he Sprig did a little too much. And like I was shocked by that because Brig was just he's not that type of person to come out of like showman. You know? Like look at me. I'm important, guys. But <laughs> we got we got to learn a bit more about Mrs. Kroger's backstory, which is pretty cool with Jonah. And Jonah's an idiot for taking thirty years to find her in a population of twenty. <laughs> but that's that's his fault. But oh my god! But it was a it was a really good episode. It was it was fun. It was a pretty fun episode. Briggs' character was bothered me a bit because he he technically I'm playing in a big quotation. Is technically almost got Mrs. Croker killed. Because, just because he won the attention from Mrs. Croker, but the rest of the time was just, it was pretty fun. It was fun to watch. It was a fun watch. Thank you, Pixels. Mm-hmm. And uh, how about you, Nick? What were your initial thoughts? Um, I mean, this was one of those season one episodes I sort of like forgot about before I joined the fan that had been like, I, I guess I got accustomed to the idea that this was like, quote unquote, Amphibia's worst episode, hands down. But like, I don't know. Now that I've gotten the chance to just review it, look back on it, really think about it on my own, I, I, it, it's a lot better that it's a lot better than I feel like a lot of people put it. Like, it's still okay. Well, I, I guess what carries this episode is its humor. <laughs> like, I feel like it's still one of um, season one's funniest episodes. Like, just, I'm constantly laughing, giggling, whatever, throughout the episode, but I, I don't know, shoot. <laughs> like, one side of me is like, I'm ready to criticize this episode. <laughs> the other side's like, I, I'm ready to defend this well. I guess it's, it's, every, I feel like everyone's issues with this episode is valid, but I feel like what still carries it for me is the fact that it's hilarious. If Amphibia did not have its trademark good humor for this episode then i i I would have like left this to the wolves to be torn apart but (laughs) that's all i can say for it oh wait it's (laughs) i'm glad it lets us get to know about get to know more about sadie croker we get some fun little moments of um ann and polly um hopefully what did what Sadie mention? Like, like the, the organization? Like, I mean, hopefully that comes back in season three some way. I mean, Matt did say season one plot lines would come back in some way, but beyond that, I don't know what else to say about this episode. It, it was funny. It was funny. All right. Thank you, Nick. And yeah, like she mentioned, or Jonah mentioned the guild. The guild would take her, him back if he got rid of, got rid of Sadie. I mean, Mr. Croker, yeah, which I don't know. I think I guessing that's just a one off, but Bang. I mean, I I thought the Grub Hog was a one off until it made its triumphant return in, in Olivia and Yunan, but you never know. But okay, so I guess starting off, like I'm thinking, where, what's the best place to start here? Because like. Sprig and tells him exactly what he needs to hear, and he just like flat out ignores. I don't want to say ignore because he, like, he's right there. <laughs> like, 
what does that mean? <laughs> like, why did you, why did you just ignore that? Like, that's just me going overboard. I think. It's fine. I. Yeah, like you just gotta. It feels like I'm talking. I'm thinking more about other episodes than this episode itself. It just feels like seeing this episode makes me like appreciate Thai feud more. <laughs> Hey. But to be fair, we do that anyway when we talk about other episodes. So, yeah, that's true. It's 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 the lore aspect of Amphibia, which is really great about this show. So, oh, pardon. What what'd you say, Pixels? I said it's the lore part of Amphibia that we kind of always dive into. Other, we always compare the episode we talk about in a certain podcast episode into. And we say we just talk about other episodes that are not part of the <laughs> schedule of what we're talking yeah. about. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, we're always like sort of looking back and like what we like. Yeah, looking back on past episodes, what we know. Because when we talk about True Color, yeah. we just went batshit crazy over two A. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> and. Uh... Can yeah, I just like? I, I like how much like Polly, Hop Hop, and Anne just like. Yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> they didn't like, give a damn. Yeah, yeah, they just didn't give a shit. They were on the sidelines. Like, yeah, <laughs> Spring was just like, guys, guys, Sadie Kroger doesn't like me. They're just like, oh, okay. <laughs> or, what's, what's for dinner? <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> they just, it's. Uh, I, I just don't know what to say. Just, I, I know the crew. The crew is in love with the idea of making Sprig into like a little shit, but like, I, don't, I still don't even know my, my whole opinion on it. I feel like I'm okay with it, but I can totally see why other people aren't. Because it's not exactly tied to like a, a character arc for Sprig, I feel like. Because I feel like a lot of times his conflicts are sort of introduced in the episode and like, that's it. It's, it's not something that sort of has its own momentum. I feel like. And I guess that's, I guess that's like the sort of problem people have this episode, right? Like, Sprig desperately wanting people to like him is an idea that's introduced in this episode. Oh, I guess it comes back up in like Caravan Named Desire. What was it called again? A Caravan Named Desire? I, I forgot yeah, Caravan, Caravan yeah. Ma- Named Desire. Yeah. I, I guess it sort of comes back in there, but like, it's just, it feels like such a self contained idea. With Sprig, I, it's just unfortunate. I guess it's just unfortunate because I feel like, for me, they didn't really do an awful job with like what they wanted to handle here. But like, with the fact that it's such a self-contained idea, and the fact that like there's already stigma against little shit characters, there's it, it's not a good mix for a lot of people. You know what I mean? Like, I guess that's sort of why there's there was such a negative response to this episode. Well, I mean. Sprig being an attention seeker, that that kind of came back in Spider Sprig. I'm trying to think of a season two episode that kind of addressed this. Yeah. I know. I don't think there's I mean, any. Is, is, that how we should, is, is that how we should like label all Sprig's episodes? Like him just. Well, not all the time. I, I, you know what I mean? Like the, the episodes where he like lashes out and so people are telling him not to. Like. Is that, is that just like, yeah, I guess that sort of is labeled out for a right attention seeker. Um, I mean, that, that mostly like plays into his like age as well. So. Yeah, that's true. See, it's, and I guess it sort of feels awkward in a story where like all the other characters, they're evolving themselves, right? Like they're, they're either changing a part of themselves or adding something to it. And like, and, and to have a character where like, a lot of his episodes are just based around the fact that he's a little kid, and of course he's going to get up to this stuff. It's like, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it's, it's going to like, yeah, it's really going to like just turn a bunch of people off. Like, I can understand why. We just got to hold out hope for uh, yeah. Pink <laughs> Frog Lady. Yeah, hope. Just, because it's... Lead. Damn. Because it's, it's like... When Spring's at his best, he's amazing. But then when he's at yeah. his worst, you can just... There's a very strong argument that he's like... 
I hate to say this. I know Sprint fans are going to tear me apart for saying this, but like, there's, there could be a very strong argument that he's like the weakest out of the main cast. Like, I, I, I wouldn't be saying that. Like, if, if before fixing Pro Bowl, I would have been putting that down to Pauly, but like, with what we have now, I'm sorry, Sprint fans, but like, <laughs> Sprint on his own, not Spran, not good development for Hop Pop or anyone else, but Sprint on his own, it's. I hate to say this, but like, commit to everyone else. He's, he's turning up a little weak. Yeah, like, I, I was also, like, I'd also agree with you. That, like, Sprig is a lot more, like, a lot more interesting. Or, like, he's like a, he yeah. feels a lot more valuable when he's, like, playing off mm-hmm. everything, anything else. Like, uh, I will say that he has matured a bit. Yeah, he's Spring. definitely. He's, I guess he, he knows, has like less. He knows guess, when to stop. He knows when yeah. to stop. Yeah, he's more aware of that. Yeah, I guess. Yes. Yeah, because he he knows when. He's more responsible. Now, I guess. <laughs> he can I mean, say that. But, like, right. but like, in Thai feud, he like. Yeah, it's he, his immediate thought was like just like, Mrs. Boonchai was just like, oh yeah, this guy Ned just keeps wanting our recipes, and then Spring immediate was like, all right, let's. Let's ruin this man's livelihood. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's just like I, and that day, I don't know. I, feel, I like I just like I'm also kind of scared because like the crew they're like, yeah, let's go. We love little shit spread, right? Like we all saw that tweet. We all we all saw that tweet of them celebrating so spring acting like this. So like, yeah, for, for, I think uh, for for Rusha, she yeah. like had that image. <laughs> <laughs> she was talking about how she loves him like that. Oh man! <laughs> so, I don't know. He might, he might. He may or may not say like that for the rest of the season. Who knows? Dang. Ah, it, it oh, hurts. I guess. It, I, I guess. In, I guess in Thai feud that. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I, I guess in Thai feud Ned was like technically taking their business. I mean, if we want to. If we want a head cannon, we could just think of Sprig <laughs> thinking about like Hop Pop like competing at the farmers market. Yeah, yeah, and I guess we can sort of excuse Sprig with the whole you know mother thing. You know what I mean? Like how he's like really desperate, like to sort of. Well, I don't even know. He has he hasn't really made that direct. He hasn't really like directly put that out there. But like, right, you know what like, I mean? Sort of, like, he, he wants to fill up the spaces that I'm missing up that I'm missing in his family. Yeah, like Ty, like in this episode made me appreciate Ty Feud more because at least with Ty Feud, like behind all of like the wacky shenanigans, Sprig had a very like, like a very like deep rooted emotional reason for behind all that. Here it's just like he just wants Mrs. Croker to like it. Like, yeah, even, at least like, yeah. Go, even, yeah, keep going. And even even though Sprig is being kind of like crazy like even mrs croker is just like by default an asshole for not like oh my god yeah (laughs) like right away and even when she explained it like i just don't like you get out of (laughs) here yeah it's like (laughs) she doesn't i don't even know (laughs) he he needed to hear that he needed to hear that but like i really do agree with you on type feud because like even that type feud still has the sort of consistency where sprig you know, you know what I mean? Like, he's very, like, protecting over his family, and he hates the idea of them falling apart. So, like, it, it, it sort of carries over from stakeout. So, like... And trip to the archives. Actually, yeah, trip... Well... Uh, actually, no, never mind, never mind. Yeah. But, yeah, it's just... Uh, it's... I find it hilarious, but I cannot deny that it is sort of an episode that just comes out of nowhere, in a way. Like, I feel like it doesn't utilize the separate parts it has well enough too. Like with Anne here, I mean, this episode's driven by Sprig trying to get someone to like him and he's putting himself through really just like, I don't know, you know, like criminal shit. And like, Anne, she's just there watching the whole thing happen and it's like, Anne, hold on. Don't you go through something similar where you want to kiss up to a group you really like and you're like to sacrifice things about yourself for that? Like, Anne, did you want to tell Sprig anything? And I guess she does, but she just complains about this one random friend we've never heard about, and then that's it. <laughs> like, that's, that's what Anne does for this episode. It's like, come on! You just had toe tax, right? Like, don't you remember toe tax? 
Isn't that literally a pro, like a prologue to reunion? And come on. Yeah, like because back in season one we knew so little about like Sasha and Marcy, and because like season one went by so fast, like there was barely a community at all, like at this time. Yeah, yeah. It's like I feel like if this was week to week, we'd probably have like a lot more people complaining about how like she didn't mention Sasha or Marcy at all and just like oh. this random kid. Oh god. Yeah, crap. <laughs> oh, oh my fucking god. You're so fucking right. You're so right about that. You're so I mean, oh, I'm in pain now. The bomb had one advantage. <laughs> yeah, one advantage. Jesus. Oh, uh, you're so right about that. I didn't know what to think. Like, this was definitely one of those episodes I just forgot about after the bomb. Like, I don't even... It, the, weird, the weirdest part is, like, I re-watched season one a bunch of times while waiting for season two, and, like, this was still an episode of my brain was like, what, is, is this a dream? Like, did I dream this episode? Like, the lost episode of Amphibia. Yeah. Like, I, I, it's, I clearly remembered Snow Day. I'm like, what the hell? This is an abomin- no, it's abomination. It's not an abomination. It's still hilarious, but it's like, what, what the hell is this thing? I don't know. It's, it's not bad. I, I just got to make my sense clear. Like, I don't think it's bad, but like, it definitely has problems that you can just like slap this episode around with, Grace. Right? Yeah, especially when the episode starts and like, Sprig is treated as like extremely likable when. That kind of like it doesn't really like contradict too much the same way with like Ivy compared to like best Franz where Sprig said he doesn't have like many friends. But like I guess here like the planners were always treated like outsiders. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. Weird. yeah. Because it, because I feel like yeah, part of the planners like sort of arc is just to like yeah, it's to really be accepted into war because I feel like yeah, they, they sort of were outcasts in a way. Like you have, like like you have, um, what was it? You have girl, like, yeah, yeah. You have girl time where Hot Pop is basically in debt to the whole freaking town. Like like they very much feel like they're outsiders compared to everyone else here. So like, just to have Sprague suddenly be the town's favorite, it, it kind of messes with things a little. So like, yeah, yeah, you're definitely right about that. Yeah, right. Like. I kind of, like, since it's a small town, like, you, you know there's at least, like, a little bit of community, but it's just that the planners would always, the planners, I assumed, were always, like, the black sheep of the town, like, the weirdos, yeah. the weird, the weirdest of the weirdos, aside from, like, Wally. <laughs> yeah, true. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah, even, yeah, the Taken and too, that must have made it, yeah, that, that must have made them stand out even more, plus, like, you can't forget that, like, when it comes to their traditions, right? Like the plant is always dead last and stuff like, uh, what was it called? Hop luck. Yeah. Hop luck. What was a hop, yeah, hop luck? Yeah, hop luck. I, I, I'm like, my brain's like, I can't come. Like, it's the fact that they have puns. Like, it's the puns for the episode titles that keep messing me up here. But uh, that, um, that episode, yeah. So it's, yeah. I feel like it's, they, they never directly say it, but like, there is this subtle feeling that the plant just don't completely. Like belong to that town. Then with Anne coming there, you know that definitely makes him stand out even more. So, yeah, it, it does sort of mess with that subtle feeling there. You know, just having Sprig suddenly be the town favorite, everyone loving him. Even so, like you go to another episode and like suddenly the trash on this family again. Like you know, it, it's kind of like I don't know, I don't know. It, it just doesn't really fit together too well. And uh, I like I, I like how we got that quick scene of uh, Sprig is about to tell Anne that she isn't likable and just like <laughs> immediately reconsiders saying that. Oh yeah, yeah, danger was approaching right there. Danger was approaching. <laughs> but I feel like that has that happened more than once between them. <laughs> like he accidentally insults her, then he's like, "Oh shit, I need to bring that back." Uh, well, that I like that moment right there. Oh, go ahead. I, I like also like Hop Ops. Like, apparently the walls are so thin that like that that yodeling joke. I don't know. It's just Bill Farmer being like, <laughs> yeah, Bill, yeah, Bill, Bill Farmer getting the stand, stand out one liners. Yeah. 
Yeah. My episodes that aren't even about him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this episode. But, yeah, like, so when Sprig breaks into Mrs. Kroger's home, like, he goes through the pipe. Uh, that kind of, like, reminded me of, like, the resolution of uh, Trip to the Archives. Oh, it's like Sprig yeah. went through the sewage system, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's nothing, nothing crazy. And then yeah. we get, like, Mrs. Croker's house being, like, very, uh, I don't know how to describe it, like, I don't want to say, like, it looks like an old person's house, <laughs> but, like, you have, like, the dolls everywhere and, like, vintage. Vintage, yeah, I guess that's a better way to put it. And we get our first, our first look at the the legendary novel in the heat of the swamp. <laughs> oh my god! Great, it's a great novel, by the way. Ten out of ten. That plot twist was insane. I don't even know the same about the episode. <laughs> like, I don't know what I want to like. I guess Polly was funny because like there's that one um, little blink and if you miss, like yeah, blink it and you miss it scene where like you know it, it's as soon as um, Jonah starts coming coming to the house dragging the what was the weapon crossbow, the crossbow. yeah yeah, yeah. crossbow on the ground like there's this shot of Polly just with like. A wide smile, big eyes, just excited about all the blood left you see in this scene. Yeah, that, that, yeah, was, that was Yeah, that was funny. <laughs> see, it's like, damn. I don't know. They, they just, if this episode wasn't as funny as it was, I, I feel like it wouldn't have been, it, it would have, I feel like it, I, I might have been able to allow people to just say it's terrible. Like, I don't know. Like, I would have just agreed with them even, maybe. But yeah. It's just a lot dang. of Sprig's expressions were great too. Oh, like the- oh yeah, he has the evil laughing. Yeah, I love that. And uh, let me—I'm checking which animation studio because this looks like. Okay, this was Sunman Image pic- Pictures. Okay, I thought it was uh, Sayram. Just some of the expressions that Sprig had just remind me of their animation, but no. This was Sunman, and they only worked on season one. Oh, wow. I guess the crew became, like, more tightly knit in season two beyond or something. Like, that's when... Because I feel like we... I know we got a couple new faces for season three, but I feel like, for the most part, the crew sort of stayed the same for season two season three. Oh, I was talking about, like, the animation studio itself. Like, oh, I know, okay. Like, Rough Draft Korea and Cyram, they stayed on. Yeah. For the rest of the series. Uh... see like usually i see one or two animation studios for like a show it's like i was surprised to see like three at least in season one i'm just wondering like like because i know like didn't matt sort of i don't know if he ever like directly matched them, but didn't like season didn't like season one itself have some like production issues or something like like i know it took like a very long time for it to get made or am I wrong? I don't, I don't really know how to have amphibious season one production. Oh, and Sunman did quite a bit in season one. Actually, all, all three studios kind of... Rough Draft Korea did, like, the least amount of uh, segments in season one. It was mostly split between Sairam and Sunman, but then, like, Later seasons, uh, Rough Draft Korea, like they they took on more segments. But yeah, I feel like yeah, something I didn't notice. I feel like season one's like I don't know, the, I don't know to say art style anime. I don't know the call, but like it, I feel like there definitely is like a different feel to like. I guess how how things were done with everything here, like if you, if you know what I mean. I yeah, feel like, I, I, yeah. yeah, I get what you mean. 
definitely has a different feel to watch the season. Which, yeah, going from season three to season one, it's just, it, it just hits different now. Just seeing Mortwood like that in Philly in a peaceful time, yeah. Try to see. There was something else I wanted to bring up. Uh, yeah, Sadie can fight. Sorry, I keep calling her Sadie because that's how they call her like in the segment. But like, yeah. Oh, yeah. So Mrs. Croker called Jonah a pervert, and I'm not sure how they were able to get that past like S and P because like I would imagine that's something that gets right. censored. <laughs> I'm surprised it got it got bypassed by that just that quick, just that easy. Yeah, maybe like I'm. I don't know. Have you guys like heard another like kids cartoon? Just like have a character call someone else a pervert. Maybe <laughs> I feel like I'm brain- I, I think maybe, but I can't fully remember. I mean, it's not like regular show because we heard oh, this yeah. crap a lot. Yeah, regular show season one, like. <laughs> I mean, radio Tyler. show like I haven't watched it, but I just know like apparently Cartoon Network wanted it to be more like more PG, like lean towards the PG side. So like they let that show like go a little <laughs> bit more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I think I. I'm ready to move on. <laughs> the pain part is over. It's this was a funny episode. I, I'm gonna put it that way. Yeah, it was, a, it was a funny episode. episode. Yeah, sure. it was it a was funny was episode. It was a very hilarious. Funny it was hilarious. But I still like. I knew. I I remember watching the time. I thought Mrs. Croker was like the creep. Like I thought she was like the stalker, and that's what the twist of the episode would be. But then I was just like, then once like Jonah like just pulled out the crossbow, I was like, oh okay, like now like he he yeah. was the creep. <laughs> was he? Is he dead? He's probably dead, right? He's probably dead. <laughs> he has to be. Yeah, he has really to cool. be. Because like she said, you should have let sleep and <laughs> you should have let sleep and frogs lie, Jonah. <laughs> no, then was did yeah? Did she, yeah, she threatened him something even worse than that, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure dead. Archie ate him. Yeah. Yeah, the last thing you gotta do is laugh at Spray for being an idiot. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you think he's fucking died after that. Jesus, so Sprague, ba- <laughs> Sprague basically led a man to his death. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know. It's, it's a funny episode. I have. That, that, that's, that's what I'm gonna leave it off on. It's a funny episode. Mm-hmm. But, I don't know, just watch season three make us look like clowns. Like, like um... This episode will end up being super important. Like, like, um, like, what was what, what did you call? What was it called again? I, can't, I don't know. My brain keeps. Oh, the guild. Watch the, the guild, guild come back somehow in season three. Just, just watch that. I don't know. I'm expect because they they brought the grub hog back. So like, who knows? Who knows? But all in all, for me, this is just a funny episode. I guess with, as Sprig says, like, I guess we'll never know. <laughs> I guess we'll never know. <laughs> I guess we'll ne- <laughs> never know. <laughs> Snow Day. <laughs> so Snow Day was written by ba- written by Matt Brawley and Jack Ferrero. Uh, storyboards by Drew Applegate and Cheyenne Curtis, and directed by Derek Kirk Kim. Oh man, this was a great episode. <laughs> it was. Yep. So the episode starts off with Anne making breakfast for Hop Up and Polly. Uh, she made omelets and. This is the first time they're trying them out, and they love it. So while that's happening, Sprig immediately uh, barges in, uh, screaming. And it's just, like him and Hop Up apparently know what's going on. They have to quickly go out and get that quick joke of Anne like, packing, <laughs> packing her food. Uh, Sprig sounds the alarm by literally becoming the alarm. Him and Hop Hop travel across the town, and eventually they, the the entire town like meets up in the squ- like in the town square. Uh, Spring explains that like the temperature is dropping uh, below the frog line, which I guess here is like below zero uh, for like the third day in a row, and that means that Hyper Day, a uh, day where all the frogs immediately go into hibernation because of the cold for one day and 
it's just something that happens every year. But then eventually when they thaw out, they're like rejuvenated and fresh again. But the only problem is that since they live in Amphibia, uh, the dark twist is that one person a year always disappears and never gets seen again. So the townsfolk all say goodbye to one another. And that's before Anne uh, interrupts them all and just informs that since she's warm-blooded, she can actually just like stay and keep an eye on everyone and make sure no one can disappear. So the town, uh, oh, so she she calls herself like she can be their town protector. Everyone's excited, and their plan is to meet back tomorrow in town square so that Anne can just like keep an eye on all of them. But unfortunately, like Hybrid Day comes early, so so Anne has to quickly like gather them up gather everyone up uh, by herself, which is a pretty like simple task, but then she's doing her per, like, per protector role, but she eventually gets bored, so she decides to thaw out Sprig. So they have some fun to themselves. Oh, it's, it's, it's snowing, by the way. It immediately dumped like 15, 20 centimeters of snow like instantaneously, and they're all just having, f the two of them are having fun. But even though Anne thought out Sprig, uh, Sprig is clearly, uh, uh, under the influence of. Okay, I shouldn't say under the influence. He's just like sleep deprived, which makes him like kind of loopy. Uh, loopy, yes, loopy is a good word. A good disoriented. A good. I think Loopy is a better, like, yeah. family-friendly very, very family uh, description. Friendly. So, I was going to say crunk, but that's, <laughs> a different, that was a, that's different. So they have their fun, and then eventually, once like they're done messing around, they do a quick head count, and then they find out Polly's missing. So eventually, Sprague and Anne track down Polly to this really creepy cave. They go inside, and they're attacked by this like giant ferret, uh, who has like Polly up on the ceiling of this cave. So like Anne fights it for a bit. Sprig tries to get Polly, but then the ferret falls. Sprig. Uh, like Anne eventually finds out that. The ferret is a mother that has like a bunch of babies and that it's just trying to feed its family. So then she decides to use the omelet she packed as, I guess, like a peace offering to the ferret. And like while it's distracted, like they take Polly and head out. So then eventually everyone thaws out. They're all proud of Anne for defending them, but then eventually Anne comes clean about how, uh, she wasn't being responsible, but just her by just by admitting she wasn't she was irresponsible, the townsfolk believe that she is even more responsible for admitting that. So they're all proud proud of Anne. Like they're happy that they can depend on Anne for the, for her help. Uh and the segment ends just when you think Anne uh is let off easily. Uh Sprig still in his loopy state reveals that reveals the photos they took of their uh fun activities while the town was frozen, such as using their bodies for bowling pins. And that's Snow Day. So like on the surface, this episode doesn't really seem like that much. Yeah. But I just really liked how this episode kind of called back like this definitely feels like a post toe tax episode where Anne has like Anne and the town have set up Anne as like a possible like protector role. I think this is the only instance where Anne actually does this, but it was mm -hmm. still nice to see. And like we still get all of like the dark morbid comedy of just like this town accepting the fact that they lose one of their own every year to this event. 
Mm-hmm. And this is like outside of any other threats. Right. That they encounter. So it's uh all of them surviving is a pretty like it's probably a very big uh achievement. Yeah. This year. But yeah, other than that, it was just like a fun episode of Anne like mm-hmm. Yeah, like not a lot happens. It's just it's just a fun episode. And I like, think it's just, I like the environments we saw. The new yeah, especially yeah. The it's snow because it's snow. Probably. It's snow. Snow is always beautiful to look at, either in three D, two D, or in real life. So it's just beautiful to look at. So yeah, yeah. I guess I guess pixels. What what were your thoughts on this segment? It was a really. It was pretty. It was a really good episode. Is like I like the backstory. Like, oh, this is what happens, and I, I kind of find it pretty gruesome when the the townsfolk are like saying goodbye to each other. I <laughs> like they don't have any hope whatsoever, and I don't blame them. But I like how Anne stood up and said, "Hey, I can take on. I can. I can help you guys survive this." It's like. Our maturity is growing more and more with each episode we see, and that's a really good step for her to do. <laughs> yeah, even though she uh, bought them, mostly the planters, and they got very loopy. But I also want to say that's I love those the lowest segments of them just getting loopy. But then, but I think it was Sprig that was trying that was like. He was the one who was getting everything back together, his mind. So, um, but after that, like you said, there's like not that much to talk about. But just look at the environment, and also it's just like it's winter themed, so it's always a plus in my book. So yeah, that's what I have to say. All right, thank you, Pixels, and yeah, I, I like how. Even when Sprig is in his like, even when Sprig's loopy, he's still pretty like competent. Like he was able to track down Polly, was pretty close to retrieving Polly, and yeah, Sprig is still still badass even when he's loopy. <laughs> uh, Nick, what were your thoughts on this segment? Honestly, I'm with you on that. It's it's a really fun episode. And it's especially nice to have an episode like this coming off of Toe Tax, which really does feel like they're acknowledging sort of Anne Savalmo with the town in there. You know, it, it's, it's just really nice to have her take out that town protector role that she, that, yeah, that they were talking about all the way back in Toe Tax. Um, lots of funny gags. It's, an, it's another, even so you weren't expecting it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sprint episode. It sort of is a sprint episode too, which I like. You know, I always love. I always love seeing Anne and Sprig just hang out on an episode. Season one has a lot of those, so I always love getting to those. Um, yeah, it really, even so, it's not a Christmas episode. It still does feel, it still does have that holiday spirit to it. Like, they don't directly acknowledge Christmas, but hey, I mean, there's snow, there's all the colors with the, the plants, such as, yeah, the mushroom lights, yeah. Those remind me of Christmas. So, like, it definitely does give you that Christmassy feel to it. Not a huge lot to say. Yeah, it, it's not like a, a big development episode, but it's it's still though. It's it's just it's really nice to think about you know what this means for Anne a longer journey in season one. You know because it, because it does feel so. Yeah, huge things don't really happen in this episode, but it's still just to know that this was there and that it really does connect to something that's meaningful for her. You know that's just really nice to have. So yeah, that, that's what I got. All right, thank you, Nick. And yeah, like, I guess to start off, uh, I'm trying to think. So in, okay, no omelets weren't the first things the planners ate on Earth. Never mind, that was noodles. I just like how. So in in this episode, like, it has Pop Up and Polly in the kitchen eating eggs and made them, and then like. In Thai feud, it was Mrs. Boon Choi making eggs for uh, Hop Up and Hop Up and Polly. But I guess 
and this is before Sprig interrupts them, so maybe there's maybe there's some parallels or <laughs> there. <laughs> when I said parallels, I was rubbing my hands together. <laughs> yeah. And then but that alarm thing just like had me like the first time I saw like that scene of Hop Up just carrying Sprig as an alarm just like <laughs> was like hilarious for me. <laughs> yeah. And then even that like that joke where the, once they get to the not joke that like visual gag where once they get to the town like while Sprig's hop- talking Hop Up like just collapses. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, honestly this. I didn't think about how funny this episode was, but like, you're right. Just yeah, I'm thinking back at everything. And actually, this is episode. Yeah, it's, it's hilarious too. It's hilarious too. And then, yeah, it's just so dark. Where like this whole this whole town yeah. just starts like saying goodbye to one another. Yeah, they just, they just accept a possible goodbye. Hop pop. Yeah, the, the way they say goodbye, possible Polly. goodbye. It's just it, it's miserable. It's miserable. It's funny, but it's also yeah, it is miserable. <laughs> and like no, and, and I love how Hop Hop always calls out Anne for it too, <laughs> because yeah, because Anne was like yeah, Anne didn't want any of this, and he's like you're kind of spinning on tradition, Anne. <laughs> like, we do uh, say that this episode. I'm I'm checking the. I, I think because it, it's right when he wouldn't hug them. I think that's when that's when Hop Hop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah you're right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's like you're kind of spinning on tradition, Anne. Let's see this. Yeah, yeah, I got to that too. Yeah, usually he says like similar every time Anne tries yeah. to like. Every time Anne like gets her opinion in on in on this, like I think she she, she does that yeah. with uh, Sprig's birthday too. Yeah, the hop up tells her that she's being culturally insensitive. <laughs> and Yeah, the warm-blooded joke. And that random, like, frog beside Wally is just like, well, everyone's like, after Anne agrees to watch, like, to look after them, that one random frog is just like, I'm gonna burn my will. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, it's just, just miserable. The, the state of the thing is just miserable. Because, because it, it, the fact that they have so many traditions and customs that just surround death, it really just speaks out to you just how common it is in their extremely dangerous world i mean yeah i, I don't know it, it's just sad when you think about it today <laughs> oh but i like like one of my favorite lines from this episode is and when she's talking about like right after she agrees to like like you know matt and jack were foreshadowing when they had and mention how, like, this... I'm gonna read out all, everything Anne says. She says, I feel like my time here has been leading up to this moment. Uh, what else? It feels like fate and karma combined to one. Uh, all of her senses feel heightened, like the whole world has slowed down. I'm totally aware of everything all around me. It's almost like... It's foreshadowing for Calamity Anne. Yeah, it's a little too on the nose. It's a little too Very on the nose. on the nose. I mean, you can even say that, like, the time where her time in the town has led up to this moment, like, like, we all know it's, like, leading, like, like, reunion immediately comes to, comes to mind. Yeah. Right. Like, not, and so just re-watching this episode, you're just thinking, like, not yet. <laughs> but soon. It definitely is one of those like eye catching lines in season one. You know, you know what I mean? Like those like knowing what we know now of the story, it's like you just can't help but think that they that they really had a huge intention behind certain scenes or lines back in season one. And, like I really did feel out that scene right there, you know. Just, yeah, it's a very like geez, nudge, yeah. nudge, wink wink. Yeah, because it's like her powers are tied like not even just like how the plot develops in season one, but also just how her powers work too. Like it's, it's very yeah. tied to that. Yeah. But, oh yeah, I guess they also sort of did that. Um, oh yeah, yeah. D- didn't Sprig make a town projector? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't um, what, what did she? What did Sprig say? He said like town freak to town protector. 
I very, I, I really like that narrative or something. Think it like that. Oh yeah, I, like I'm trying to remember if it was this episode or another one. Uh, I think it was. Let me see. I think it was right after she made her speech that she'd protect them all. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Town Beast 2. Yep. Oh. Yeah, Town Beast to Town Protector. I'm a, I'm a fan of that narrative, yeah. Basically representing the fans right there, Sprig. Yeah, it's, it's pretty nice. You know, it's... I, I, yeah, I know, like, the... Sh I know... Yeah, I don't know. I guess I... I know people are, like, the biggest fans of when, like, a show directly nudges at its sort of narrative or idea or themes or whatever. But I feel like Infinity does that really well here. Like, it, 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 it has fun. Like, it, it knows what it's... Like, yeah, it's not subtle with what it's setting out to do, but, like, you know, they always, they always like, do their best fit, and, like, you know, it's, just, it's, just, it's still fun and nice. So it's fun. I don't, I don't know where I'm getting at, but I'm just, I don't know, I just had to put that out there. Yeah, I guess when... Like, when Amphibia makes meta jokes about, like, the structure of their plot, like, I think it's, like, alright. But, like, when I really, like, I... I find the jokes where they talk about, like, how how their com how the common tropes uh, are still, like, executed well. I, I, I like those jokes a lot more, because, like, it's Amphibia just, like, showing off that it's, like, doing a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and I... And, like, the best part is it does feel deserved. Like, the better jokes where they basically compliment themselves, it's, it's deserved. Like, I, I got to give them that. I got to give them that. Yeah, I guess when they're – what's the term when you do something where it's, like, it's like when, the, when they admit that they did something, like, not great but still make fun of it? What was it? Uh, lampshading, I think. It's, like, I don't yeah. like the lampshading jokes, but I like the jokes where they just, like, Kind of like just love to smell their own fart. <laughs> I like those jokes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a reason why no one uses that analogy. <laughs> uh, yeah, we talked about Loopy Sprig, we talked about that line. Oh, what about the monster designs? Oh, I was gonna talk about the like the the frozen montage. Ah, uh, scenes like they're just like violating. Didn't didn't yeah. someone say like at the end of the segment that they felt violated? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they <felt> violated. <laughs> like, didn't they make? I don't even know they. <laughs> they, they're, they're, they're shipping Wally and uh, yeah. Stoker. <laughs> Jeez. And I guess it's like it shows that while yeah, even so Anne even so Anne tried to make this commitment. It still shows that she's it still shows that Anne has like a long way to go, you know what I mean? Like yeah. even so yeah, she's growing, she's changing, there's <laughs> like she clearly has some has some things she needs to correct. Especially in this episode. Like like well like, I'm just, I'm looking over the montage too right now, like she I still feel bad for. I still feel bad for Spring. Uh, I'm just gonna go for Spring real quick. Like, I always felt bad for him getting thought out in this episode because we never get to see him feeling better. Like, right after he's thought out, that's how he acts for the rest of the episode. Like, he, he looks like he's just like he's just delirious the whole time. <laughs> this is the poor, the poor little kid. Yeah, I felt bad for Spring, but. I, I guess he, he turned out okay. <laughs> and all the gags where he gets hurt, it doesn't make it any, it doesn't make it any better. Because, yeah. Oh man, but yeah, it, it is a really fun up. Like yeah, they use they use Loggle and they use Loggle and like I don't even what is this I guess guy's like name? Mr. Flower. Yeah, I guess I forgot. I guess I forgot. Maybe yeah, like it's snowboards. Yeah. Oh, they use them as bowling pins too. <laughs> That's great. What? Wow, Sprig literally ran him Ivy. He had no room. I saw that. He had Wait, what, do do? what do you do to Ivy? There was, like, he used Ivy as a bowling pin. <laughs> it was literally zero remorse. He didn't care. How dare you, Sprig? 
I mean, uh, they they were in a couple at the time, so it's uh, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Man, I mean, wow. I, I I've been able to say like when I actually pay attention to those montages like fully, I'm like, Jesus, they really did that to them, right? Like they they made them into some kind of neck or something. Like they tied them up with rope, and I don't even know if they I don't even know what they're trying to do. Yeah, they're just making like a like a snow ice. Ice Man. I don't want yeah. to say snowman, like an ice sculpture. Oh, not sculpture, so yeah, just an ice man. That's all I can Man. I can't blame that one guy for saying that he felt violated. Like <laughs> this was Jesus. Man. The fact they took photos to, the fact they took photos too. Like it wasn't Sprague revealed it. It was like, hey look everyone, we took photos too or something. Like I don't fully remember. Mm-hmm. And then we got a the cave design was nice cuz like still keeping with the snow theme except like oh yeah the the ice be- like the ice shards become kind of like sorry the, the ice becomes kind of like crystal shards and uh yeah just throw a couple of skeletons here and there if you got yourself a intimidating setting <laughs> mm-hmm. I also have like the like ooh, what what animal is that like a giant ferret or something? Like, yeah, I, I thought it was a ferret or like a, yeah. a weasel. Like, it looks I was like I a mean, mole. No, like I thought moles would be like more like stubby. Yeah, well, but I mean, are, are they blind too or something? Yeah, I think moles are sensitive to light. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not. Amphibia is always on point of their creature design. I think this well, is like, yeah we. Yeah, I think the interesting thing is with this one. Um, did, yeah, I don't think we. Have, I don't think we really ever saw like an animal like a like you know like a sort of mammal or something amphibian, right? Like have, like before this. I mean, I guess we have the grub hog, but like I think we didn't we have a montage that showed the giant skunk in uh, Trip to the Archives. I, I'm trying to look. I'm looking at like the titles of past episodes to see if we yeah. had something with the mantis, the the bug monster, and. The piranha plants, or so the tom- the tomato plants. We had Domino, Domino too. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, Domino, yeah. And, or and the and the he- the hedgehogs. Oh yeah, okay, those two. I, I guess I guess it's just like one of the more rare animals to sort of play with this show. I'm just like looking over the scene, like where Anne's like, <laughs> Anne's getting away, and then she does like a little <laughs> knock, the duck face. Yeah, that was that was pretty funny. Oh, with the uh, with the with the ferret at the end. Yeah, yeah. When she's getting away, she does like a little funny nod. Oh yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. and then they have yeah, yeah they, they have, have like that like nod, the noise, yeah. the, the yeah, little, yeah. Oh, I kind of like how. I liked how so the cave itself is like very like there's a lot of blue, a lot of ice, a lot of dark colors, and then the entrance to the uh, the nest has like the green the green curtains. It's a nice contrast. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a nice way to set up just how yeah yeah that's a really good observation. So yeah, everything here just sort of has like a dull or just dead color to it. Then then we have the gr- the greens and blues. Set up here with like the pink baby fans. Yeah, it is a really nice contrast for like the feel here because before you just thought saw this as like a pit of despair, but then you just really see it's like a struggling mother trying to help her kids survive. So yeah, that was really nice. And somehow Anne packed her packed the omelet so that none of it would spill out, <laughs> despite there being like no lids on. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's it's pretty cool though. You know, like I feel like it's her, her restaurant skills coming in handy. So it's another nice thing to look back on. She bet they never yeah, got the had... omelets though. They looked good. Yeah, none of. Yeah, like none of those things. The, the omelet looked good though. Oh man! Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like none of those bowls had lids on them. Like she just kept them in her bag. <laughs> Even, like, won't they come back? Like, it was just, it was just one omelet, wasn't it? <laughs> like, is that going to be enough to sustain them for the winter? Well, 
I mean, Polly was already pretty small, so it's. Uh, <laughs> I'm. Why? <laughs> I guess it's just for. Oh yeah, for the mention, but just the fact that it takes one drop of snow to turn the whole, <laughs> to turn to all, to turn all amphibians to like the snow wasteland. Like I have to say, that just reminds me of Bone, where like. Oh, yeah, that's ex- yeah, that's exactly the first snow. thing. Yeah, is the reference of snow immediately falling. I've seen that in Bone and Calvin and Hobbes. But like when I first saw this episode, like yeah, my mind immediately went to Bone, where like yeah, mm-hmm. I believe I believe it was the first book, right? That was like the very like the the first season where he has to like survive. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting off track. Yeah, there was I don't know. I just love that. Yeah, I, I was I was love that. Movie. The this, is, this is a nice little funny gag. Yeah, just the snow is dropping <laughs> instantly. Uh. Yeah, it's it's nice to mention Bone. <laughs> uh, that that just made me nostalgic. Oh. <laughs> Same here. Same. I mean, I I remember when like the final book came out. That was a like the final book in color, and that was like a bunch of hype at school. Yeah. I <laughs> my brother did something cruel to me with the final book. Like, like he he told me. <laughs> I didn't find out the final book came out until like years after. Like he he basically convinced me that like it, it was like delayed or something. <laughs> what? <laughs> so I didn't I didn't like realize the final book was a thing until like I don't know like I, most of the fandom moved on or something. I don't I don't even know what to say, but yeah, I was late with it. Yeah, like now that I think about it, like amphibious. Amphibious story kind of reminds me of Bone, just like in terms of like the way the book escalated, like the state. Yeah, yeah because we, we went from like a humble, yeah. like, like, yeah, humble town adventures in the first book to them walking between zones where if you step out of line, you're fine, right? right? Like, yeah, you like, die the, or something? like, yeah, your the, soul the dead, was like, the, the something circles, yeah, like, yeah. Like, like, and like, what was her name? I forgot her name, but like, they had to guide them. Through, like, she was the only person who could see like the differences between like Earth and that zone, right? She had to guide them out of there. Like, it really does give. Like, it really does have that same feelings as Amphibia, where we're like, yeah, it's a the first sort of fish three... out. It's just a fish out of water story, right? Right. Like, it like, has that. Too, oh yeah. Right? The first three books are very like focused on the town, and then like very slowly, you have like outside forces like coming in. And then eventually they have to travel outside. And then, like, the rest, like, it was a family that got stranded in this new world. And they eventually, like, reunite with each other. Yeah. By, like, the first book, I think. But then, like, somewhere in between, they got separated again. They eventually had to go to, like, the capital. Yeah, this is. It is. Yeah, I need to brush up on my. Okay, my not bone only board. are you making me want to read Bone again, but, like, <laughs> like this is. Wow. Like, I. I Wow, and then holy, oh man, man my, my, my so, mind's race. Like I'm just like making bone and amphibia compare. Like you have the three brothers, the trio. Yeah, you have like the family that like that adopts it, them. It, yeah, like and it is <laughs> like it's messing my mind now, but it's all there. It's all there. And wasn't that that rat creature guy like that rat creature guy's like basically grime? Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god, like so, it's oh, so is it no, just rare rare we... than bone together <laughs> combined <laughs> yeah. with like no. with some Dragon Ball Z. Don't we, don't we have everywhere? like don't, don't we have like that 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 do we do we have like the, the main villain who worships like this evil god or something, right? Like didn't she? I, I can't fully remember like, like, yeah. Is there something like Yeah, it's... there was something like that. I don't like, I need to read Lord, it's been Lord like a long locusts. time. Yeah, it's been like a long time. Oh, there it is, Lord of Yes, okay. Okay, yeah, now, yeah, now it's in my head. I, I need to like. Now you're making me want to reread Bone, but like, it's all there. Wasn't there? There's like, damn it. <laughs> no, we're moving away from Snow to Bone, but like, <laughs> wow. They, it's a, it's a, it's a good some, tangent. Yeah. Man. Yeah, we gotta, we gotta read up on that later. Yeah, I, I am definitely rereading Bone now. I mean, isn't there like a? Wasn't there like a? I didn't make a show. Was like a rat creature king or something? Like, wasn't there like a like a really big one? Yeah, that's the one I was talking about for Grime, like yeah. king, king Rock or whatever. There we go. 
Yeah. Yeah, didn't he lose his tongue? I, yep, it's all coming back. Didn't he lose his tongue? Yeah, he like, gets his tongue, t- tongue cut off and then... Yeah, it's yeah, slowly and, all and, coming back to me. Yeah, and also, actually, I don't want to talk about... The, I, I'm i thinking, like, no one's going to care if I talk about, like, the twists of Bone, where, like, the, the hooded figure was the grandma's sister. Yeah. And then, like... <laughs> damn. It's just I I'm I'm definitely rereading Bone like that is that is on my mind now that yeah. is on my I am rereading Bone now because it is it has like because it does it definitely has that same feeling where it's where if you go to like say like a, a random volume in the series like say like volume six or something and and then you just think back about volume one you're like holy shit how did we get here how did we go from these humble beginnings to this. Like world ending, yeah, like a world ending conflict. It, it's crazy. It's crazy how it works. But yeah, Amphibia definitely has that same vibe. I mean, just with, just with what we have going on now, like the stakes. You compare the stakes we have now back to season one here, where like an average episode would just basically be Anne hanging off of the planters or either the, or, or either Wartwood. It's yeah, like, it, and then I feel like. And I feel like that's definitely the feeling Matt wanted to capture, right? Like you said, like that's how you because that's um that's part of his motivation, like just writing Anne herself. Like he he wants a character who you can look back on from say say like the first season, the very beginning, and just say, wow, you know, they've really changed, they've really progressed. And I feel like that's something he also applied to the series. The fact that it's it's evolved so much from what it started with. It, it's something just greater. For sure, and, and it never like this evolution didn't like happen suddenly. It was always yeah. like every episode like focused on like a gear, and then eventually yeah. like you see like the whole machine. Yeah, I see. Yeah, because you, it's when like all these pieces you notice here and there just finally start to come together. Like you don't even like, and and like of course like some of these some of these like parts are like more important than others, but like yeah. Like worst case, you have like a screw, and then, but I mean, like one screw on its own is not that like important. But when you have like three or four, then like at least like it's holding something together. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Amphibia and Bone, they definitely share that in their structure, right? Just just progression from like a simple, a simple story about a town, about about like just a simple fish out of water story, just to like. <laughs> to finding out that you're somehow tied to like a world ending conflict like it is very similar very very similar oh and they couldn't leave the valley because it was like winter or something oh yeah okay okay <laughs> no, this is too much for you now, now yeah, 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 yeah. yeah okay I, I think we're gonna <laughs> uh, we should we should stop talking about bone for now yeah oh it lord like yeah, well, yeah we're I, am a TV re- show. Rereading so. I am definitely rereading Bone. I am definitely rereading Bone. Like, I'm waiting for the show to come out. I'm just trying to find out the dates. I feel like even when I was like a kid, there were rumors about a Bone, like a Bone yeah. show coming out. So like, I'm not gonna, like, I'm not gonna get my hopes up until like I see like the actual product. <laughs> yeah, it's been. Yeah, I feel like I've heard about this for like a very long time. Seriously. Like, I've I heard about like it for like a decade, it. over a decade. <laughs> for me. Right. Yeah. Oh man, I guess is there anything else we need to talk about for? <laughs> See, it's ah dang, <laughs> just, uh, I don't even know what we can say. It's uh, I feel like we're we're sort of in like I know next week or sorry not next week tomorrow I know all in and we'll definitely have like things we want to say. But I feel oh, yeah. it's uh, I I hate doing this to an episode where like there's just not much for us to pull at. But like I, I, I will say, I, I, this episode definitely still deserves its own compliments because it's a very important episode to have with season one, especially with Anne's journey because this is coming off of Toe Tax, where she's finally cemented into town and it's cemented into more when it's like an actual important or valuable figure to them, right? Like they actually see her as a person now; they no longer disrespect her. So it is it, it's super sweet to see Anne have something like this because we all know that's important for her, and like, and I guess like. You know, I don't even I don't know the conclusion besides just saying Snow Day. Snow Day is important. It's important to answer. It is. All right, thank you, Nick. And Pixel, uh, Pixels, any like 
final thoughts you want to give um, us? No, just like what Nick said. It's a very important episode to to Anne and her like growth as a character. Like it's just showing like how responsible she can be and like how it connects to season two and how season three played out with her responsibility and stuff. In a way, it's kind of like that. It's like the polar opposite with season three. It's just that it's the hero life, human. It's the it's like the human world and stuff. And uh, and will do anything to just protect them. And it, it can keep, people can compare that to Snow Day. Yeah, it's 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 a good episode. It's a really good episode. They're one of my favorites, to be honest. All right, thank you, Pixels. Oh, we forgot about talk about the. Uh, I forgot to mention the the credits or the outro. In this, <clears throat> oh in episode. yeah, so, we can't so that. yeah, it was like it's a snowy theme, and it kind of makes me wonder, like, like why was it snow day the second segment? <laughs> I know it, it is like bizarre. I, I I honestly forgot we were gonna get that special outro, and then when I saw it, I was like, yeah. I, I thought it was the same as you. I was like, well, why wasn't why was this not second? Why was this place first? But I don't know. It, it it really is unfortunate though, because I mean we I mean at this point we all know it. I mean, Snow Day was like definitely planned to air summer near December, but because of the bomb format, things got messed up and it just kind of took away the Christmas feel. Yeah. It was in yeah. Ju- yeah, July. It, it stole away the Christmas feel that this episode was supposed to have, and I, that's just really unfortunate. Oh man, it's just like like the bomb format. I think I wouldn't say it was all terrible. Like I know because I think the the span, like the time frame of season one, was I think about three months. So if they did like air, like airing all of these, like kind of made sense. Not, I don't want to say made sense because it's a stupid decision. Uh, <laughs> I guess like all these like sh- little short stories in this one spot, like yeah, like we're. Ho- I-, I feel like I might be saying this in the next few couple of weeks, where it's like Warwood was like the the trading ground, the Great Plateau. Uh, if you're if you're Breath of the Wild fan, for if you're Zelda fans, uh. Yeah, it's just like this nice, like self-contained zone where everyone, like, like, well, especially Anne, got to like figure her way out or her like what she could be instead of what she was before entering Amphibia. Yeah, it's just, yeah, just like Snow Day, just like that, like simple act of just like being like attempting to be a protector, like kind of showed. How far she came. Yeah, I guess those are my my final thoughts on Snow Day. I mean, okay, so with that, like, is is there anything else you guys want to add on? I I know you're. I already asked you. I just uh, I guess I just, really. I mean, I, I just want to like talk about the bomb front out real quick and just like yeah, yeah sure thing. I mean, with me, I feel like my feelings on that have always been super conflict, like, you know, super conflicted. And like, one hand, I, I know it was just bad for the reception, you know, just bad for the reception of the show itself. But, like, I, I just can't help but feel, like, nostalgic at the same time. Because as these do feel like sort of like, you know, their own self-contained stories, like their own every, like, like it's sort of like we basically saw, like, their lives in Wartwood, like, their everyday lives in Warwood, basically every day of the week, right? And I guess, like, I don't know, you know, they're, they're, it, it didn't really capture that feeling. It's supposed to be like this slice of li- this humble slice of life show that, that sticks to one town the whole season. And I feel like, yeah, while it's really bad for the reception of the show itself, just getting people's, just getting attention on it, just getting, like, what it deserves. Like, it, it's bad for that. But at the same time, for me, it's... I don't know. It really captured a special feeling to me because it's like a slice of life show and like I could turn it on every day and I just, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm getting at, but like, you know, it just felt special to me in a way. Yeah. And I think 
yeah, you said that. You said it really well. Uh, I guess with that, like, I've covered pretty much everything. Uh, I guess that concludes this week's this week's recording. <laughs> and pain's over. What? What's over? <laughs> the, the, the pain. pain the pain. <laughs> oh not, wow. The pain. The pain ended a little bit like earlier than that when we finished Kroger. But but, but still. <laughs> I mean, no, no, this is, there's no, there's not, <laughs> and maybe it doesn't have a bad episode. There are episodes where I, I go out feeling like, could have better. Mis- yeah, it could have been better, but like, there's not a single episode where I look at it and think like, where I, where I just don't think at all. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, same for me. I, 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 yeah, there are episodes where I'll like, complain about things but like i'm never but my, my final thought is never oh yeah this is a bad episode. like never right um, i i can always say that i at least enjoyed sitting down and watching it yeah <laughs> but i guess next week we'll be covering i mean if you're listening to this you will be covering uh a night at the inn and wally and Anne next week but we're actually recording it tomorrow because <laughs> yeah. the, the holidays are approaching just to mm-hmm. free up my schedule a bit. <laughs> so I mean, I'm kind of back. Su- yeah. I'm kind of surprised we're yeah, 30, we'd be... 34 yeah. recordings. That's yeah. Well, so we're almost done with season one. Like, Oh right? yeah. We are. Yeah. We're, we're almost done. Like we're really close to just finishing it. We're close yeah, we're to the reunion. To, yeah, yeah. We're about next week or, Next week will be about seventy five percent done season one. Yeah. So if everything if everything works out, if like I I don't have the schedule on me right now, but theoretically if we keep covering an episode a week, we'll be we'll cover everything by April, I believe. And that's like kind of an ideal time mm-hmm. when three B could come back. So I, I don't want to say worst case, but hopefully we get through all the episodes and we have a week or two to discuss like any like big news or right. special topics. Worst case, like I mean, in the worst case scenario where we have like to cover like three more episodes and the show's coming back in less than a month, we might I might just power through those like last three episodes. So I, I don't want to like. Imagine covering like the final episode of like the series yeah. and just being like, okay guys, let's cover uh Sleepover to end all sleepovers. Look, we just saw a <laughs> yeah. decent episode, but just like yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, let's it would, yeah, it would feel kinda odd. Oh, what what if we cover it like right after the finale ends, we're all in tears and just like, okay, let's sh- let's talk about the shut in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But we'll we'll figure it out when we get there. Like we'll get mm-hmm. once we have a better idea of how everything's gonna play out. But with that, I think we're gonna end this recording. Thanks for listening. If you like this, if you like listening to this podcast, uh, if you like listening to us talk about Amphibia for half an hour and then bone the comic book series bone for another half hour uh you can listen to us wherever you listen your to your podcasts like google podcasts we have an rss feed spotify we're also on youtube we try to be accessible yes and then you, you don't need to like and subscribe but if you really like this record this uh this podcast, be sure to share it with your friends. Well, they can't dislike it anymore, so <laughs> you, you're forced to like it. You're forced to like it. <laughs> Those are your only options. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, thanks for listening, and see you guys next time. Say goodbye, everyone. Adios, muchachos. See ya. <laughs>